Welcome back to the series, guys. The top 90 albums of the 90s. And we've hit the top 50 in this one. Uh, basically, now we're halfway through the list after this episode. Uh, crazy to think. It just feels like these things keep going faster and faster whenever we start doing them. But, of course, I'm here again with uh, John Stanick of Johnny Radio uh, to uh, bring a, you this guy's this episode. Uh, thank you for joining me once again on this series. And uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, man. Every episode gets uh, seems like it gets more and more interesting. But uh, I know we'll have some, uh, you know, some back and forth on this one, perhaps. Mm. But uh, but we'll see. But yeah, I, I'm excited to get to the upper half, man. It's uh, it's it's getting better, and uh, also, well, we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. I might be with you there. Uh, maybe not uh, in a complete agreement on what we're talking about, but. Uh... Definitely agree with the sentiment nonetheless. So let's stop talking and uh, get to the real stuff here. Right to number 50. Fear of a Black Planet by Public Enemy from 1990. Uh, Chuck D, Flavor Flav, The Bomb Squad are back. And uh, I actually... Um, if I had to pick a favorite Public Enemy album, this would be it. I just feel like they took what they did on their first album and brought in uh, just even more of uh, social commentary, songs like Fight the Power, um, 911 as a joke. Uh, Flavor Flav gets uh, a, a lot of airtime on this album as well. Songs like Can't Do Nothing For You, Man. The grooves are just fantastic throughout the whole album. Uh, but yeah, you got Welcome to the Terror Dome. You got Power to the People. I mean, just so many classic tracks uh, for people who love this group. And um, yeah, I think, you know, overall... At, at 20 tracks it might be a little long but for the most part um this is probably uh their finest hour and that's really saying something well i disagree i i think um takes a nation of millions to hold us back is probably their best work but i know a lot of people lump this number one and two so i mean this made my list granted a little bit lower but I mean, this is a damn good album from top to bottom. I mean, like you said, Welcome to the Terror Dome is obviously one that stands out. My favorite, actually, is Burn Hollywood Burn uh, mm. with uh, Ice Cube and Big Daddy Kane, which yeah. I think is one of, you know, talking about how they Hollywood forces blacks to kind of be, you know, play a certain uh, type of representation and roles in Hollywood time. And obviously, that's gotten... Uh, better over the past few years but this has been a topic of conversation for a while uh you know especially recently so the fact they're talking about it in 91 uh mm -hmm. says a lot i think and just so many great the thing i never understood about the criticism well i probably understand why uh but the the reason like people would say oh public enemy are they're criminals and like all this stuff uh I don't understand that. I mean, for a group that's pushing forward, not messages of violence, but like empowerment to their own community mm -hmm. really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, you know, that's America for you, I guess. Uh, but I think that this album just from top to bottom is really solid. I think it falls off on the second half as I feel kind of similarly about their last album. But, you know, and I also think for is, you know, I guess a forward thinking as it is the fact that there's like an interlude kind of talking about AIDS and, and, uh, you know, gay men who have AIDS in a derogatory manner, I feel is a little bit uh, contradicting. Sure. I know the time they were a little bit more homophobic back then, but I don't think it, it plays off well regardless. So uh, that's what holds us back from me loving this album, really. But I I can't blame it for being on the list. As I said, I voted for it. I uh, would put it a little bit lower, but uh, can't argue it. Yeah, Public absolutely. Great pick, guys. So, um, yeah, I, and I would say, you know... Um, just thinking back to like House Party, uh, the movie with Kid and Play, where you hear Public Enemy multiple times in the movie. It's, uh, you know, I think it's a great compliment to the band that you uh, would want to have a dance party while listening to uh, some of these, uh, you know, really important messages, which... Uh, maybe not the AIDS one, but you know, yeah, uh, yeah, some no, of the but, others. Yeah, I mean, especially fight the power, which I think I believe was voted number two on uh, Rolling Stone's list of five hundred greatest songs of all time. 
obviously that list has its problems and I would not put it that high, but I mean, just obviously a debuting in uh, Spike Lee's do the right thing, the way it's utilized so amazingly in that film, but obviously Mm -hmm. that iconic line, you know, Elvis was a hero to many, but he never meant shit to me. Not that I agree with it. I agree with the John Wayne thing, uh, not necessarily on out, but I get what Chuck D's getting at, especially with the idea of cultural appropriation and fighting the the powers that be and and having a voice. I mean, it's it's really iconic to the point that uh, apparently Chuck D said Stevie Wonder asked him, he's like, hey, he's like, can you say the Elvis line, man? And then he was just like started laughing or something. So you That's know, great. when when you get Stevie Wonder going, uh, I I think that you you got to give uh, credit where credit's due, but. Uh, Brilliant song and a really, really good album. So, yeah, guys, that's going to take us to number 49. Homogenic by Bjork from 1997. Yeah, this album is so influential in in so many ways. And and I like to compare this album uh, to another of of Bjork's from the 90s, which is Post, because the argument always is, oh, which one's better? I think that this is better, and and I use this in the same way I compare Kid A to uh, OK Computer, where I think the songs on OK Computer are overall better than the songs on Kid A, but I think as a cohesive uh, experience and and as an album, I think that this works uh, a lot better. Uh, Just the sonic cohesion and and vision, I I think, really put homogenic above post on uh, in a lot of ways. And I think obviously mentioning Radiohead, I think is very apt for this because this was their biggest influence while making Kid A. And you can hear it all over this album here, especially the fusion of crazily complex beats and lush strings and really a bunch of other um, organic instruments uh, such as accordions. I I, I mean, it's mind-blowing what Bjork accomplishes sonically on this album. And just the way she explores, like, glitch pop on the song Pluto, absolutely uh, amazing. And that's the thing. This isn't the most incredibly accessible album, but I I think it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, If you really sink your teeth into the music and, and, and just see what she's doing with the layering and the sonic textures and everything. And I just have to mention so many uh, great songs and and just how it's basically her talking about like, and I I think this kind of is the same way in a lot of Bjork stuff, but just talking about like the human connection and, and what brings people together. And I don't think that's more articulated than on alarm call, which is my favorite Uh, song on here and you know like when she's like making that proclamation like that she wants to go to the mountaintop with a radio and good batteries and and blast a joyous tune that will free the human race from their suffering i mean if that isn't what music is about then i don't know what is i i just think from top to bottom though whether it be a hunter opening up this thing uh unravel i mean there's so many great songs on here and that's the thing the only reason I didn't have it higher on my list, I believe it was in my top 30. So I think it should be a little bit higher, especially with influence, uh, you know, keeping that in mind. But I think that it isn't the most accessible. So maybe that's why it lands on here. But I think it absolutely deserves a spot on this list. Well, what I would say is for my overrated, pretentious Icelandic music, uh, I think, you know, I like Sigur Rós better. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and yes, I do call her that because, um, yeah, I don't know, man, like it's all over the place and I, I don't like what? her voice. So, uh, I, I did not dig this album. I, if I had to pick between this and post, I do like post more, but I'm just not a big Bjork fan. So, um, yeah, this didn't make my list. But you, but you certainly can't discredit what she did here because obviously, you know, with the the bands that I know that you so love, uh, sure, we we definitely have to. Sure, yeah, she's a big yeah. influence on many people. I get it, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but not on me. So okay, but, uh, but yeah, to, but to say it's a mess though, I mean, I I get like because that's the thing. I I love Bjork's voice because. I, I get the only thing with her voice is I think it's a little hard to understand her sometimes, but I think she has so much control and so much resonance, especially when she gets up there and starts. it's like the better version of, of a lot of like what Kate Bush did on her early records that I don't like until hounds of love, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, and hounds of love is better than this album. Let me just uh, say that. But I think that what Bjork 
did with her voice vocally. I mean, nobody sounds like her, um, for sure. So yeah. I, I mean, I get it to some extent, but I think technically, uh, I think she's a great singer. So, okay. but um, well, not yeah, I mean. Yeah, not for everybody. And I didn't say it's a mess. I, I did say it's all over the place. What I meant by that is, oh, okay. you know, like, I don't know. It's just, it's difficult to sometimes follow where the music is going. Uh, like, yeah. you, like you said yourself, it's not as accessible. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so this one just didn't do it for me, but, but I can sure, see but why I, you dig. Right, because I think for its time, I mean, it is just so beyond anything that was going on uh, in electronic yeah. music. She really pushed... Uh, this to a whole new playing field that I think uh, would be even perfected uh, some more uh, yeah. later and on. For and, the and record, I mean, I, as much as I love Kid A, I do like OK Computer more. So that may yeah. make a little more sense as to our differing uh, opinions. But that could yeah. be. But I but I don't think the gap is as wide when it comes to Radiohead. So. No, no, for sure. <laughs> that, that, is, that is something we will we'll keep in mind for down the road. Uh, but regardless, I think that's a great pick. So uh, let's go to number 48. The Black Album by Metallica from 1991. They're, you know their massive hit uh this is when they decided to i guess go a little more commercial bringing bob rock into the mix as a producer and uh with songs like enter sandman which stayed true to their hard rock roots but also with this just extremely catchy riff uh i mean they just they had you from there and then of course the the hits keep coming with sad but true wherever i may roam Nothing Else Matters, which uh, to this day may be their best song. I mean, it's such a compelling ballad, uh, one that even Elton John uh, would go on to say is like just one of the greatest songs of all time. Uh, so that says something. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, some of the guitar work throughout the album by Kirk Hammett is some of the best stuff he's ever done. Uh, definitely the songwriting by James Hetfield was on a different level than they had done previously. Um, I know a lot of the metal heads may uh, disagree with that. Um, the album overall at over an hour, um, I think it's a, a little long, a little bloated. Um, songs like The Unforgiven, which was a big hit, doesn't do a whole lot for me personally. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag overall, but with the songs that I mentioned, the big hits, uh, I think it, it really deserves a spot on the list. I mean, wherever I may roam, I think is just incredible uh, the, what they do on that song with the, that guitar riff, uh, which sounds like a, something, you know, Middle Eastern. And then they just uh, keep building on it. Incredible track. But um, yeah, uh, glad it made the list. Well, I'll say um, Enter Sandman uh, is my favorite Metallica song. I, I know that's the obvious choice, but it, come on, it's incredible. It's it's one of their best hooks. Uh, it's just so iconic. Uh, Unforgiven, I actually think is really cool. And Nothing Else Matters, I, I definitely think that's the other standout uh, besides Enter Sandman. Mm -hmm. But as you said... This and 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 obviously, you know, I think going this is a perfect transition from the last album, um, maybe not in quality, but I, I think where you're talking like I was talking about how that was so influential and groundbreaking but not accessible. I think that this is one of the perfect examples where this is commercial sellout. Uh this album is so overrated, I don't even understand why it's this high on the list. I because I've said my piece about Metallica on the 80 series. I, I think that they're uh, a really you know technically a really great band but not one i'm really drawn into so i thought oh if they're going a bit more uh pop oriented maybe i'll enjoy that the sound the, the songs sound exactly the same by the end and I, at that at over an hour i'm just worn out and i'm just like come on like can can't you do something more original and something that stands out a bit more i i, I just feel like this kind of falls in monotony and i think it's okay uh, just because of those songs I mentioned, uh, which are awesome, but yeah, I this why is this in the top fifty? What the hell? Like I really don't understand this at all. This is literally the definition yeah. of a sellout album. 
Absolutely. I don't know. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I, oh, I, would. I wouldn't have it this high on the list. It was yeah. much lower on mine. It did barely make my list, but um, yeah, I mean, to call it sellout, I don't know that that's fair. I mean, uh, technically I think they were looking to go more commercial and they achieved their goal. I mean, and, and I think they had a great batch of songs here. Like the, the hits really do hit. So um, like you said to me about Bjork, you can't discredit, man. Well, I think when it depends, because I feel like when you're going commercial, sometimes it works because sometimes you could be innovative, but I don't think that they were doing anything innovative here. I just think that they were making songs that sounded exactly the same besides a few here and there. So I have to give credit to those songs, but I can't give credit to the whole album except for its commercial success. But then again, well, I don't know if I, I, I am under the impression that you know obviously influences in the mainstream are maybe what matter the most because that's what you get the most exposure to but i don't always think commercial success is everything sure so sure. that's that's my take on this album i hope it's a measured one i still think it's overrated and i i don't know if it deserves to be on the list but uh you know if it made it lower i'd be like okay but i yeah this this doesn't deserve to be in the top 50 at all well, yeah, I could see that. But Enter Sandman and Nothing Else Matters alone, it does deserve to make the list at least. So good pick, well, guys. Those songs are great. That's all I'll say on that. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to number 47. Wow! I feel good. I do 20 all-time greatest hits by James Brown, released in 1991. This is a compilation, and I'm so glad this made the list. And I know this is one that we're going to agree on on this episode. And uh, how can you not? I mean, so many amazing songs just from the opening track of I Got You, I Feel Good. Come on, man. Right when he comes in with I Feel Ow! Good. Yes. Do -do 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 -do. Come on, man. And then get up. I feel like being a sex machine. Uh, just class. I mean, hit after hit. Uh, so much funkiness throughout this album. I got the feeling. Mother popcorn. Uh, Papa's got a brand new bag. And then you've got, I mean, uh, different sides to his genius on uh, ballads like It's a Man's 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 World. Incredible song. And his vocals, I mean, what just unreal throughout Amazing. all these tracks. Uh, you know, it's what can you say about, about James Brown? I mean, talk about uh, somebody that has inspired so many artists, not just in funk music, but in rock and uh, just about every genre you can imagine. And uh, the, then you got like super bad. You've got um, Papa Don't Take No Mess is such a fun song. That's like, uh, I want to say, uh, no, I, I'm thinking of the payback. That's seven plus minutes, oh. but uh, that one as well. I mean, it doesn't get old. The grooves are so strong. The The band that, uh, is, oh my God, just one of the best rhythm sections of all time. And uh, yeah, I could go on and on, but I'm so glad this made it. Yeah, me too, man. Uh, because, yeah, obviously is, these songs aren't from the 90s, but um, right. my goodness, this this is just incredible. And and I think this is really when I kind of really got into the James Brown after you told me to, to listen to this. I mean, obviously, I got you. I feel good. Everybody knows that I feel good. <laughs> you know that I would now, you know. Just so good. I mean, what can you say about him as a vocalist? One of the, I'd say top 10 greatest vocalists of all time. And I yeah. think you get that throughout this album. But man, so many great hits. Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, part one, uh, which is obviously <laughs> such a classic. Um, and just the, the, the vocal runs, he does the, ain't no drink. Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. I just picture him like spinning around. I yeah. mean, one of the greatest performers uh, ever uh, and maybe the most influential performer of all time in that sense but as you said i mean so many great songs in here i think really when you get to the second half uh i just think it really gets uh it, it gets skyrocketed to absolutely incredible heights especially the payback man my goodness one of the hardest songs i've ever heard in my entire life and then when he's like wailing at the near the oh, end yeah. of the when song those it, screams man that's crazy yeah one of the greatest vocal performances i've ever heard on any record yeah, like that. Honestly, you can see how Prince got the influence, 
like the influence from him. But man, this dude took it to an even higher level vocally. I mean, there's no denying that. Uh, and of course, songs like Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, part one, uh, which is obviously such a huge uh you know change in his in his repertoire and as the story goes apparently i don't know if this is true but in the in the back uh room of one of his shows apparently the black panthers put like a bomb in in his uh in his dressing room i don't know how true that is but i i think the, it was basically saying like you know you aren't saying any messages uh, uh you know to empower the black community and so he, his perspective really started to change by uh, the end of the 60s. And you can hear it in songs like that. And then, of course, Super Bad, man. I mean, what a classic, classic track. Obviously gave the uh, title to the film of the same name, which is uh, equally uh, incredible. Um, and, and then, of course, my favorite song on here, maybe my favorite James Brown song is Get Up Off of That Thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is just, dude, the... the the, the synth going on in the background or whatever is and just him get on ball for that thing and dance <laughs> you feel better i mean it's just so funky and, and the horns coming in i mean it's the perfect example of a comeback track obviously because this is in the late 70s but man just this whole album just shows you really the the father of funk uh at his absolute finest and just shows like speaking of the 90s shows how indicative his music was on the hip hop to follow because he is the most sampled uh, artist in the history of hip hop. And it shows yeah. here why that is. I mean, some of the hardest grooves ever laid down the record, the funkiest I've ever heard. And I think it's only fitting uh, for someone like James Brown as, as legendary as he was and uh, still is to this day. One of the most influential artists. Uh, I definitely say top 10 most influential artists of all time without question. Yeah, and the music is just so joyous. I like, I, I dare anyone to listen to it and not be happy listening. I mean, it's just incredible, man. So great I, pick. I, yeah, absolutely. I can tell you, I was certainly happy listening to that. So yeah, guys, awesome, awesome pick. Really glad that it made it that high. Uh, despite being a compilation album on the list, it was just outside of my top 10 uh, on the list when I submitted it, and I'm glad to see it uh, right where it is. And so that's going to take us to number 46. Aquemini by none other than Outcast from 1998. You see, I got the shirt here, the two boys. Big Boy and Andre 3000, one of the greatest duos to ever hit music. And honestly, I'm really not sure why this album is this low. This should at least be in the top 20. I think that this is one of the most influential hip-hop albums of all time, and quite frankly, one of the best. And I think just from, obviously, Return of the G, obviously breaking down that kind of mentality of gangster rap, which... Obviously, Outkast is so, you know, acclaimed and heralded for doing something different, I think, kicks off right from the beginning. But then you have songs like Rosa Parks, which is one of the best party bops of all time. And the, hey, hey, hush that bus, everybody, everybody move to, to the, the back, back of the bus. Of the bus. I yeah. mean, just who would have thought to, like, write a party song <laughs> centering <laughs> around Rosa Parks? Like, it's crazy, but it is the most Southern hip-hop thing I've ever seen, especially that harmonica that comes in mm -hmm. at the end. It's like, what is this, like, hee-haw stuff yeah. going on here? Like, it really feels like so different from anything else going on in hip-hop at the time because obviously there was the east coast west coast uh war that was going on even though you know the, it was it, it, great music is great music i don't see the you know need right. for that but a lot of people weren't really crediting the south at all uh for their hip-hop and i think this is the album that really broke it open so many great hooks across this entire thing like skew it on the barbie uh which you know is old school take us to new school fools can't keep a job like kangaroos you know it's <laughs> andre on the chorus here just going hard but i think obviously this features raekwon who really has a killer verse and i think that's super significant too as to what i was saying about the east coast west coast hip-hop board because obviously from wu-tang uh on the east coast having someone be on this record really showed you know like i think great talent respects great talent and and i think that this was a step forward 
to ending uh, that conflict between the two sides and embracing uh, Southern hip hop. But regardless, I mean, so many great tracks, the title track, obviously bringing their two, you know, Aquarius and the Gemini, bringing them together, you know, um, do our die it's him and i equimini it says the whole story right there synthesizer yet again as these crazy synthesizer sounds or sounds as the song would suggest but george clinton shows up once like we were talking about again. him in the last episode here he is yeah uh, once again uh but so many great the art of storytelling part one uh just andre 3000 uh you know just kind of rec- recounting this tragic tale of this girl uh that he knew and how she became a victim to the streets i mean one of their most powerful songs lyrically and then of course i mean obviously there's even a track that was dedicated to me i guess even though that this was (laughs) came out uh just less than a year before my inception um but so many great songs rounding this thing out y'all scared is another one liberation uh, CeeLo Green is on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Chonky Fire is a great, has a really hard driving guitar riff to close this out. But I think one of the best Outcast songs of all time, and I think easily the best song on this album, is Spody Ode Dopalicious, which, <laughs> my goodness, especially when you hear those horns come in. And that's the other great thing about Outcast is not only would they use samples, but they would uh, bring in organic instrumentation. You hear those horns. Yeah. I mean, that is been sampled uh you know onwards uh just one of the most iconic horn riffs of all time i would say but just them talking about these these black clubs and in atlanta and these these people coming there to kind of like have their fix and kind of unwind for the weekend kind of get the sensual night and just you know into that party atmosphere and how i i think maybe big boy's best verse of all time how he talks about how he met uh his his girlfriend that he you know he later said you know little did i know i'd be you know be sharing uh two kids with her and just the way he talks about something that seems so i i guess innocent well not innocent but definitely something more casual how it turns into something so beautiful and life affirming i just think it's one of the most beautiful songs in their entire catalog i think one of the most iconic and yeah i think that just from top to bottom it you know it's it's maybe like a slightly inconsistent in regards to how it's structured but man this is a damn good album and and i think one of outcast absolute best which i think that they would even go on to top later on their next release i mean this is a fantastic choice i just kind of wondering scratching my head why it's this low because this is one of the most influential albums of all time i would even say Wow, that's high praise. But yeah, for I mean, yeah. Uh, for hip hop, definitely. I mean, and really putting Atlanta on the map. And it's cool that this comes right after James Brown, <laughs> also uh, Atlanta native. Very so, funky. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, exactly. The funk lives on in, uh, you know, in the current day and, and bringing it forward. Andre 3000 is incredible. I mean, both of them are, are just incredible oh, at what they do. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I, everybody that's featured here is great. Um, uh, I think you said it all, man. It's, it's great to see them here. And um, yeah, I can understand why you'd want to see it higher. But uh, I think it's at a pretty good spot. I still think it could be higher, but regardless, I just think the the messages here as well, you know, talk, you know, relating to self preservation and black empowerment, uh, especially as I said with Spodiote Dopalicious. I mean, it it doesn't get uh, there are better hip hop albums even from the '90s, but it doesn't really get that much better than this. This is such a great choice. Uh, once again, I'm going to say it. I wish it was higher, but I'm glad to see it uh, in the top fifty at the very least. So yeah, guys, that's going to take us to number forty five. Buena Vista Social Club from 1997. Yes, so glad this is uh, in the top half of the list because it deserves to be that high, if not higher. Just This is just incredible and something that I had not been exposed to until very recently, uh, just before we started making this list. And uh, it's so great when you can find something you didn't know existed before. And, uh, you know, Ry Cooter, uh, very well-known guitarist, uh, spent many uh, vacations in Cuba and met all these amazing uh, instrumentalists and vocalists down there and was like, how are these people not like famous in the world and decided to make an album and 
is just one of the greatest Latin albums of all time. And you've got just artists that were at the time of recording this, I think uh, Kampai Segundo was in his 80s and um, Ibrahim Ferrer, uh, an amazing vocalist. Uh, just everybody that plays on this album is just incredible. Uh, but from the opening of Chan Chan, uh, which just has this very hypnotic guitar riff that you don't want to let go of. Uh, there's El Cuarto de Tula, which has just some of the most amazing lead guitar work that I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, like there's beautiful ballads, Dos Gardenias and uh, Orgua Sida. Uh, there's, I mean, I could go on and on about this album, but uh, you just have to experience it because it's one of those records that when you listen to it, it, it can transport you to Havana, Cuba. It's like, it, it just makes you feel like uh, you're just immersed in the culture and it's, it's a thing of beauty. I'm so glad it's here. It's like uh, The Godfather 2 in a much lighter context. So there you go. No, just, just transporting. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah. see what you mean. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, I I agree with a, a lot of what you said. I I think that this, you know, obviously you told me about this, and this album is great. Honestly, one of the most interesting, uh, you know, I guess you could call it a jazz album, but it, it really is, you know, that kind of um, but Michael, you know, uh, Cubano style uh, music, which is just so incredible. Uh, I think I will say I think Chan Chan's a little bit too repetitive for my taste, but I'll tell you I mean once you get to Pueblo Nuevo, just the, that that piano and and, and guitar uh, mm -hmm. filled song, I, it's just one of the best instrumentals I've ever heard. The 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 changes that they go through chord wise and just obviously at the end they're just on fire like they are not stopping and it is just so engrossing to listen to uh, mm -hmm. from start to finish. But as you said, Dos Gardenias is another one. Uh, y tu que has hecho. I mean, there's so many. My favorite is Candela. I think has one of the best, maybe the best hook on the entire album. Just so catchy, so immediate, uh, so propulsive. I mean, it it is exactly what you would want to hear from this style of music. You know, from these musicians working at such a high proficiency. Also, absolutely love Mormullo. I I just yes. Mormullo. I I don't know because there's two L's, but so beautiful and, and and you can just picture yourself underneath the stars being serenaded by like a mariachi band i mean as you said it really puts you in that time and place and man yeah. this is this is a damn good album i honestly I, this is right around where i had it on my list so i honestly think it's at a perfect spot i granted i mean i don't know if i agree with it being above aquemini but i certainly don't disagree with the placement on this list because you know i mean not a lot of people seemingly knew this so that's why i, I throw that out there against aquemini but i'm so glad it made the list uh this high because it really is one of the best albums uh, from the 90s. And, and I think it, you know, might not get all the credit that it deserves. Yeah. And if you like the album, definitely seek out the documentary as well uh, by Wim Wenders. It's uh, it, it'll make you love it even more. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I can't wait to check that out, man. Once I once I get a little bit more time here, hopefully I can check it out down the line. Uh, and I believe it is on HBO Max if you guys uh, want to check that down. Perhaps I'll leave the, the link uh, down in the description below for you to check it out if it is indeed on there, which it should be. Anyways, great choice, guys. Uh, absolutely love that album. And that's going to take us to number 44. Solomon's ancestry. Yo. Yo, what's up, son? Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers by the Wu-Tang Clan from 1993. Uh, what most people would consider one of the most influential albums of all time, uh, specifically in hip hop. Uh, I did have it on my list, uh, obviously. I mean, just for Cream alone, uh, you know, Cash Rules. Uh, I forgot what it stands for, but I mean, obviously, it's so iconic in so many ways. Um, really, this, I think, more than anything, is just an exercise in, in uh, you know, lyrical finesse. Uh, as you hear from Raekwon, Method Man, uh, RZA, Jizza, uh, Dirty Old Bastard. I, I think those are definitely the ones that stand out to me the most out of this, this rap troupe. But I, I think for me, 
I don't know. Like, this is something I, I just didn't have time to go back to. I'm very busy. So I uh, didn't have time to go back to this. I wanted to, but I couldn't. Uh, I, I just think from when I heard it, I think the samples are a little too simplistic with the piano. I know it's influential, but I don't know. Like, it's just not my personal favorite. I actually think that uh, Liquid Swords by Jizza is better. And I, I haven't listened to Raekwon solo stuff or, or any of them, really. Oh, Ghostface Killer. I forgot to mention him. Obviously, one of the best rappers in the game. Uh, maybe the best rapper in uh, the Wu-Tang Clan. I don't know. He's certainly up there. But I feel like... Maybe they did some better stuff solo wise, but I do want to come back to this album again because it's so iconic and it's so influential. Um, so I personally don't think it's one of the uh absolute best albums of the 90s, like a lot of people say it does, but it certainly deserves a spot on this list. And while I didn't have it this high, I'd probably have it near the bottom of the list. Uh, I'm certainly not going to argue it uh being this high because as I said, it, it really is. Uh, favorite to so many people and uh, maybe i just need to go back to it and, and i'll like it even more yeah it's, it's been a few months since i heard it as well but um i can definitely see where it's influential but i i agree with you that like the samples aren't as strong uh on here and and i would even go as far as to say the production but maybe yeah. you know just as an origin story for all these great rappers, because yeah, I mean, all these guys that you mentioned, RZA, Jizza, Method Man, I think all of them have gone on to do bigger and greater things uh, in their solo careers. But um, yeah, I mean, there, but there's a bunch of great tracks. I mean, Bring to Ruckus is great, uh, Protect Your yeah. Neck, uh, Cream, as you mentioned. But um, but yeah, I think it is a little high on the list. Uh, I would have it much lower as well. But um, but yeah, it's good to see them represented. Yeah, I mean, as I said, maybe maybe we're missing a little something. I don't know. I that's why I want. I definitely agree with you though that it's. I I, I mean, Equemini puts this to shame musically. Honestly, I think. But mm -hmm. um, the rapping is just so expertly done that um, I think that yeah, has sure. to be noted and. Uh, Take into consideration why it is this high on the list. So, yeah, good pick, guys. And that's going to take us to number 43. Host by Bjork from 1995. Her second entry on this list and in this episode, uh, as I was saying, uh, obviously this one won out uh, by a little bit over Homogenic, and I, I get it. I mean... I think it's almost just as good. I don't I don't think it's as uh consistent, I would say, as the last album, but I think it's definitely more memorable in in a lot of ways, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, so many great songs. I mean, especially not my favorite, but Army of Me really sets the tone of this because her debut was certainly unlike anything I'd ever heard, but this is where I think she really refined her craft uh in, in really taking trip hop to a whole other level. I think uh, Bjork is one of the the greatest artists of all time. I I would even say she's one of my absolute favorites. I think she's pushed music forward in a way that hardly anybody has had done in in the past like twenty five years. Uh, so you got to give her credit where credits due there. Um, but Hyper Ballad is just absolutely insane. I think perfect example of what I've been talking about. But just like how she's like talking about like throwing objects off a cliff and watching them crash and then picturing her body in their place. It's like, geez, like the lyrical darkness that she reaches on this album, especially that song, even though it's the 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 beats are 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 so just you know nonstop and just very upbeat, quite literally. Uh, obviously a lot of the stuff going underneath the surface is a little bit deeper and darker than that, but man, I mean, and then just the amount of musical diversity on this album, this is what I will definitely give this over homogenic is you, like, you listen to like, Oh, so quiet. She takes an old standard, uh, with beautiful instrumentation, might I add, um, so many cool things going on there musically, um, and just the strings and just her going, shh. It's like so funny to me. Uh, but then when she breaks out screaming uh, with this, you know, like this big jazz uh, sort of big band feel like it's a Sinatra record or something. It's like Sinatra mixed with uh, Kate Bush and Pink Floyd. I mean, it's insane. Uh, and, and that's my favorite song on the record just because the musical uh, audaciousness of it all, I think, is incredible. Um, and then, of course, Izobel, which is another absolutely 
fantastic track on this, especially with those those horns coming in at the beginning, really setting this very atmospheric, very pleasant mood, of course, until it explodes into this electronic banger. Uh, absolutely amazing. I Miss You is another one that is absolutely relentless in, in regards to how hard the beat goes. Uh, I mean, just what she was doing musically, I think, is incredible on this. Obviously, I think the last track, it's really good, but I think it goes on for too long. Uh, but man, it's just very consistent throughout. Uh, not saying every track is great, but certainly the, the I don't think there's really a weak song on here. And I think once again, uh, definitely one of the more influential albums from the 90s. So really glad to see it here. I would even put it a little bit higher, but hey, I'll definitely take it at this spot on the list. Uh, I, I just have to roll my eyes and go with it, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're definitely in the minority here. <laughs> I guess. Well, but uh, yeah, I mean, I do like Army of Me. I, I'll say that. And um, and I do think Post is the better of the two albums. So um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, very influential. So <laughs> must be reiterated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, just a awesome, awesome album. Uh, glad to see Bjork here once again. And yeah, that's going to take us into number 42. I don't practice Santeria. I ain't got no crystal ball. Sublime, the self-titled album from 1996, posthumously released after the death of Bradley Noel. And uh, really sad because I think that um, out of Sublime's discography, this was them just really getting onto something with uh, some of these uh, extremely catchy, regified songs like what i got um santeria which is just just one of the greatest hooks of the 90s you got uh ridiculous jams like april 29th 1992 about uh the the riots and uh essentially um saying like you know, hey, you should steal from stores. Kind of a weird message. Uh, these guys weren't always, um, let's say, you know, uh, doing the right thing uh, on all their lyrics uh, throughout the album. But <laughs> no, it's not actually. Oh, okay. I just happen to say that. But uh, but there's a lot to love on here, even though there's some just nonsense throughout the album. But uh, my personal favorite is the closing track, "Doing Time," um, where they take a you know an old song and and make it even better. Uh, just the groove on it is so good. Uh, and then you know there's fun songs on here as well, like. Uh, wrong way and caress me down um but uh yeah i mean it it might be a little long at 17 tracks but you know based on the fact that they were trying to honor the memory of uh their fallen comrade here uh it's it's a little understandable so um it's good to see it on the list it might be a little bit high but uh it's kind of nice to see it in the top half here I would put it at the bottom half, uh, to be honest with you. Um, but that's the thing. I, I think this album is a, a little bit bloated. Uh, I will say, I think some of the tracks kind of like, I, I even really like pawn shop because I think the guitar work on there from Noel is just exceptional, but mm -hmm. I think that goes on for a little too long. I feel like some of these songs are just, nah. you know, but the best songs on here just absolutely, uh, hit it, uh, like no way that you can even imagine. Um, before hearing it obviously what i got is a classic though i'm still i still have to listen to this again so i don't know i might actually like the reprise more that not that we needed it but you know it's just a nice more acoustic take on it you can get uh, uh bradley's vocals a little bit more clearly um wrong way i mean just the stuff they're talking about obviously like a 12 year old prostitute i mean this stuff is crazy lyrically um but i i, I think just the way uh, Bradley Noel attacks these subject matters, which was always, I mean, obviously the guy who wrote date rape, like, yeah, it was going to be a bit controversial. And that song still, you can question it's, it's, it's merits because it's like, is he saying this as a joke? Cause obviously right. the girl gets the justice, but you know, then he, you know, he's like saying, you know, I don't have much sympathy, you know, for the guy who's getting like, you know, 
uh, getting yeah. it in the ass. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but I, I I mean, I think it's a great song, but regardless, I won't go on about that right now. Um, but I think, you know, that kind of shows up in like April 29th, 1992 Miami. Cause it's mm -hmm. like, on one hand, it's like, yeah, he's talking about, uh, police brutality and the Rodney King riots and how that's a terrible thing. But at the same time, I think he's missing the whole point of what like looting stores actually means right like it's it, you're not like i think taika waititi made a tweet uh after the george floyd riots where he basically said uh yeah you know this isn't for you know you white kids to go steal a led zeppelin t-shirt so that's <laughs> all i'll say about that but it still is a good yeah. song i think um but really uh the one that stands above all rest is santeria which is just one of the absolute best songs of the 90s. So good, in fact, that it was the first song that I performed at uh, Open Mic at my undergrad. Uh, so I mean, maybe nice. I can find some footage of that. And I'll, I'll put it here. But uh, yeah, I mean, that song is at, just that. I don't practice Santeria. I ain't got no crystal ball. I mean, yeah. just amazing. Noel's vocals are, you know, a cross between Bob Marley and, and I don't know. Like, you would swear that this guy was, like, Hispanic or something. And then yeah. you found out, I was like, no, it was just this white dude who loved, like, reggae music. And, I mean, it just, obviously, the musical influence. I, I don't think, even though I don't think that this is a really solid album across the board. I mean, I still haven't talked about, like, Burritos, which I think the guitar work, I think Bradley Knoll is one of the great guitar heroes of the 90s, and I don't think gets enough credit, uh, maybe because of how premature his death was. But I put him right up there with Cobain, is, is one of the best guitarists from that era. Absolutely incredible the work he does on this song. Absolutely sure. amazing. Um, of course, Caress Me Down is another great one where he's like yeah. using these Spanglish lyrics to tell this really convoluted. And the line about the kung fu grip and stuff. I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, also, I mean, just, just, it's such great beach music. Like, yeah. reggae or not, man, it's like, it's just, it, it's stuff that you're always going to have on a mix, like driving to the beach. And yeah, uh, long the, the yeah. boys from Long Beach, he says, it exactly, in the album, especially on doing time. Right. Uh, Bradley on the mic with Russ MG. I, mm -hmm. I actually, Lana Del Rey had a great cover of this on uh, her album, mm -hmm. Norman Fucking Rockwell, from a few years ago that I really, really enjoy. But yeah, I, I just think that the way he took ska punk. And, mm -hmm. and obviously alt rock and, and just the light uh, flourishes of hip hop. I mean, nobody sounded like Sublime in the 90s. Uh, and while I don't think that they're like the best band from that era, I think, you know, especially with Bradley Knowles' premature death from a heroin overdose, just so tragic. I think it puts him obviously, maybe obviously not on the same level, but within that pantheon of, of cultural icons from the 90s, like Kurt Cobain and in the mm -hmm. alt rock scene. And, and while I don't, I think that this album should definitely be lower on the list. I certainly um, agree at, as it, to being on here because it's certainly influential in a lot of ways. And I mean, just for Santeria alone, I mean, come on, that song is amazing. Gotta love it. Yeah, of in the, course. In the video too, where they're like at the at the at this Western bar, and then you see Lou Dog, rest in peace. No. Uh, yeah, so just in incredible uh, some of the stuff on this album and a really solid pick. As I said, though, could be a bit lower. Uh, certainly not better than Equemini or or Post or uh, or James Brown, but you know, regardless, let's move on to number forty one. The Color and the Shape by Foo Fighters from 1997. Now, obviously, their debut album made the list, which is obviously a Dave Grohl uh, solo project. Not a huge fan of that album, but this album, I just listened to it for the first time the other day. Uh, I think it's at a perfect spot on this list. I, I This album is awesome. And, and I the way I like to look at it, I think, you know, Kurt Cobain was John Lennon. And Dave Grohl is like Paul McCartney uh, in, in, to mm. each other in that sense. Because obviously he wasn't writing songs in the band Nirvana, but I think you really see his sensibilities for pop hooks and, and melodies on here. Because he, this is post grunge at its finest, you know, really creating these really hard driving uh, rock melodies uh, like Monkey Wrench, which is obviously such a standout on here, um, as well as 
I think up in arms. I, I mean, such an eclectic mix of really great rockers and ballads on here. Um, not my favorite song. Gotta mention my hero. I, I'm I'm just not as huge on it. Is I think it just gets a little uh, samey uh, as it goes along. Uh, but so many great songs. February stars, I think, is yet another amazing, amazing ballad. Uh, See you is yet again another one. I mean, I could go on and on about it, but ever long obviously you know that's a standout uh, yeah obviously maybe their most famous song and the last song that uh uh the the late taylor hawkins uh played with them on stage even though he's not featured on this album because i think they had a, a drummer named um was it william goldsmith but basically Grohl just kicked them to the curb and did the drum himself because <laughs> he's like one of the best drummers of all time <laughs> i right. just find that hysterical but Obviously, he brought in uh, Pat Smear and Nate Mendel on this for the first time, and that was really the start of this as a fully-fledged band. But my favorite song on here, personally, is Walking After You. My goodness, that has to be my favorite Foo Fighters song. Just such a beautiful ballad. I love the chord progression on this thing. And just Dave Grohl is an absolutely great singer. I mean, obviously, you know, maybe not better than some of his contemporaries, but his voice is so clear and, and, and so crisp on this thing. And his performances are very impassioned. And I don't think even more so than on Walking After You. Incredible, incredible track. And even New Way Home just, just drives... Uh, so hard by the end I, I think really concludes this album on a strong note and and yeah i don't think you're going to get the best lyrics here on this album it isn't one of the most uh influ like obviously i wouldn't put it above some of the albums that we mentioned in this episode like buena vista social club or equemini or any of the bjork stuff but uh man i i so happy that it made the top 50 because this is a great record and i'm glad you guys voted it on the list yeah, absolutely solid. And uh, I mean, you said it all. And and Dave Grohl, I mean, it's such an amazing story that, you know, he had this second life. I, I think we already mentioned this when we talked about the debut album, but, um, you know, I, I'm glad that this one made it this high. I personally wouldn't have had it this high, mm -hmm. but um you know and i think we both said the other album probably shouldn't have even made the list if if anything uh i'm gonna uh say one album that i think should have made the list that's in this vein and that's third eye blind and damn it they didn't make the list but uh you know i always have one grievance from from each episode and that's the one i'm gonna say today but uh but yeah great to have color in the shape man solid pick guys yeah well john I think that this one's better than Third Eye Blind. I'll, I'll just put that out there. But, and definitely yeah. more iconic because, I mean, the fact that, I, not, whether we agree with it or not, the fact they got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the first year of induction, well, Rage Against the Machine is still not in there. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, I think it but goes yeah. to show just how much people uh, love Dave Grohl and how heralded he is as a musician as well as to credit the other members in the band. Absolutely. So, yeah, guys. Uh, that concludes it for this episode. Yet again, I mean, so many uh, crazy choices in regards to, like, we had even James Brown. We had, like, 60s and 70s music. And then, obviously, we didn't even mention, like, Try Me. That's even from the 50s. So right. uh, a lot of a lot of variety on this episode. Um, and, yeah, really great picks. I, I, it's going to be – the next episode is going to be even more interesting, I think, in, in regards to the – the stuff that we agree or, or you know don't disagree on. for sure man i can't wait to get to it so uh guys this was great and uh great picks as always so can't wait to see you on the next one man now of course and make sure to subscribe to johnny radio if you haven't already and of course smash that like button subscribe to this channel uh a lot of great content coming soon maybe not uh as immediate as you'd like but uh, i'm going to be working on it working on it very soon and in the meantime you guys have a great week uh and enjoy the holidays while they're still around all right peace out guys peace see ya